continent. I'll start with you, spokesperson for UPDF. Good morning to you, Afandi. Good morning, and good morning, my friend, uh, Timothy. Uh, um, do I qualify to participate in the teaser? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 but at the yes, end. At the end. <laughs> at the end. At the end. <laughs> because I think I have the answer. Ah, yeah, you may give it away, maybe. Uh, <laughs> You're too sharp. Okay. Mm. Um, this is a very important topic. Very important in that Africa as a continent has been, um, depending on the angle you are looking at it, has been condemned, has been praised, others have given up. But what is the significance of some of these events like the African Liberation Day? Does it mean anything to you as a Ugandan? Mm -hmm. Do you even know about it? Because some of these things have been almost remote. Um, is Africa independent? I, I, know, I know how critical Timothy is. Um, and I, I look forward to hear his, uh, uh, his critique of Africa. But in my view, there was a starting point. Fault as it may have been in some cases, but there was a starting point. And they ought to have built on that starting point. And for me, I'm, I, I think, I believe it's like boarding a bus. You enjoy it starting where you have started. Mm -hmm. you, don't want, you don't have to ask where has it come from. What's important, where are you going? Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll turn to the historian, <laughs> uh, Mr. Kariyajire. In terms of what he is, his last statement is, it's not as important where you're coming from, but where you're going. But we cannot negate the fact that what we are today and where we want to go is born out of what did happen or even happened in the past. So with your submission, uh, perhaps you could allude to us your understanding of Africa, its independence, and this word liberation, what it meant at that time, what it means today. Actually, May 25th, 1963, um, that would be 60 years ago in a few days' time, isn't African Liberation Day. It's basically the founding of the organization of African Unity, the prede uh, predecessor to the African Union today. Um, yes, they, they now created around it this idea of African Liberation, but it really was just the creation of the equivalent of like the European Union, the EU. So it's not African Liberation Day per se, although that's been hijacked by the Pan-Africanists. So mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's to explain it. Um, the border question is Africa independent. Well, um, the short answer, as an increasing number of even Africans themselves say, of course not. Um, apart from the nominal facts of statehood, every independent African country has, you know, a country called 250 for Rwanda, 254 <laughs> for Kenya, 255 for Ethiopia, that sort of thing, 256 for Uganda. We have flags, we have seats at the United Nations General Assembly, we have national currencies, that sort of thing. We have diplomatic missions. Around the, in that sense, yes, you can't say that's not... Ex it's, okay, what we have is more like self-rule than independence. What Uganda had between 1961 and 62, mm -hmm. something that's not... It's, some it's or what Catholics would call purgatory, not <laughs> in heaven or not yet in hell, but it's just midway there. So you're no longer purely a colony, but you're not yet independent. So I think self-rule is more accurately where we are today. Um, I guess that really summarizes it. So the details of whether independent or not, well, that can be the topic of this morning. So what then would uh, cause a state to have the independence that you're referring to? Independence would be, okay, let me just give an example. For the last two years, this Russia. I haven't seen a country that has come under such intense international sanctions all across the board, from sports to the financial system to military to everything to trade as Russia today. And Russia can still stand. So the question then would be, imagine if, let's say, the Western countries applied about our 50th of the sanctions they have imposed on Russia, mm -hmm. would a country survive? Just that, that, that very bit. When uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic hit us, 
You remember how every minister of health in Africa was heading to the airport to receive the Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, what vaccine, those basic things. If you came under pressure, would you still stand? That, I think, is okay. the one. Oh, oh, well, I, don't, I think uh, Russia is not the best example. You're talking about a country that has seven time zones. It's a continent on its own as a country. So uh, that on its, uh, on its own is sufficient enough to make it withstand the size. Two, Russia has enormous natural resources. As Congo. Oil and gas. Congo does, but... Well, I will, uh, I will give you the difference with Congo. Oil and gas. And then, right from the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the Soviet Union was competing with the United States. So they built internal capacity to deal with another nuclear power. So that's why I think, for me, it wouldn't be the best example. Mm -hmm. it, ha it has uniqueness. The Congo you're talking about, Congo has had, um, has ra uh, lagged behind history, in my humble view, for almost 100 years. Ruled by Leopold, like a personal estate. Ruled by the Belgians, they were not very different from their king. Exploited the marrow by multinational companies to date. Ruled by a sergeant who could not comprehend what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Because a sergeant is supposed to command 30 men. You make, he becomes the president of the country. So, in my humble view, resources, resources as it is, in fact the resources became its curse because it didn't have a father, so to speak. So can we say that resources are the true independence and currency that any, any country, uh, whether on African continent or elsewhere, should be able to thrive its strength on to withstand the tides of time? Timothy. Well, um, but then you contradict uh, the, the exact point. Russia is what you described, nuclear power, you know, well-educated and all this, but that's just not what I mean. What I mean is that Russia right now has seen a bit of economic contraction since the sanctions, but there's nowhere near co collapse in sight. That's what I mean. When subjected to pressure, can you stand? By the way, Congo, contrary to this image you have for the last 100 years, actually, is it, I think 1958, Congo had one of the most educated civil servants, service, um, civil services in Africa. Mm, sir. Mm. Strange, mm, sir. Strangely, yes. They had only three graduates by independence. Three. No, they did. Their figures, I, said, I saw some, I can't remember what reported, but it wasn't this... Uh, they had only three graduates. So anyway, the, 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 the definition of what you call an independent state would be one that at the very least can defend itself militarily or withstand um, mil external military aggression in some way. Then there would be a relatively self-sustaining economy, a domestic consumer market or economy, one that is somewhat shielded from uh, the storms, especially of these fluctuating uh, global prices, to some degree. Of course, tied with the first point, it will be able to defend its borders at least and sustain a degree of internal security and stability. And if it has a national currency, can defend the currency, that sort of thing. And then during times of emergency, which we see typically of the Western world, when there is a crisis like what is in Sudan right now, countries that can evacuate their citizens mm -hmm. during those emergencies, whether it's an earthquake or like civil war, an attempted coup. Usually when those things happen, it's always the American you know, government, the European Union countries evacuate the citizens. And many African countries are left stuck during COVID-19. Many African students were stuck in China, but other national schools. So that ability to rescue your citizens, protect your citizens, no matter how few they are, defend your borders, defend your currency, defend yourselves militarily, essentially is the summary of independence, which most of Africa, I think now, I think all of Africa, it used to be South Africa, now South Africa included, it can't even supply itself electricity. In 1992, that South Africa we see used to generate, I think, two-fifths of Africa's electricity supply. Mm -hmm. Today, every single day, power cuts.
-hmm. And they say it's going to get worse and worse in the coming months. The South Africa of the MTNs, the ESCOMs and whatnot. So, okay. yes. All right, um, General Kulaidre, this brings us to the question. The things that he has mentioned, can the country defend its borders? Uganda, yes, I would believe that's the answer. Uh, can a country defend its citizens? I believe the answer is still yes for Uganda. Mm. Can it defend its currency and economy? I still believe that the answer is yes for us as Uganda. But yet we don't seem to see the unity for which uh, days such as the Africa Liberation Day were meant for. Thank you so much. Actually, the choice of 25th May was trying to have a particular day when Africa should remember that there are people who have struggled for their independence. Because Ghana 57, Nigeria 60, Congo 60, Uganda 62, Rwanda 62, Kenya 63. So when would you particularly say this is the day Africans should mark, should remember about their uh, liberation. And so, 25th May was chosen. But for me, the most important thing is the, are the African people. Do they actually know that they have a responsibility to have sustained what started by our forefathers? Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, this capacity he's talking about is consciously built. It's not, you don't just fall into things. I would like to observe that probably one of the undoing of the African continent was not charting her own path, whether politically or economically. Whatever was done was imported. Every country was pushed into a multi-party arrangement at independence. Mm -hmm. But parties are started by classes. Which class do you have in Uganda? Which class do you have in Kenya? So we, the, the fault start, as I call it in my humble view, was using other people's avenues to try to reach where we are going and yet we are not heading for the same direction. Two, do we have the ability to defend ourselves? And for me, I agree with him 100%. If you are talking about a country, a state, it must have not only a flag and a, a head of state, it must have the capacity to deal with both the internal and external threats, mm -hmm. not only to state security, but to human security as well. Uganda can survive under these pressures because we have the food. God gave us the gift of nature. But after you have survived because you are able to feed, what next? That's why some of us think that for African liberation to be realized meaningfully, we must integrate. The smallness of our countries mm -hmm. is our own undoing. You remember I mentioned why Russia is able to withstand size. Why has China become a superpower? Size and population. No one can afford to ignore them. You know, for a long time, even under the radical government of uh, Ronald Reagan, China remained with the most favored status in US foreign policy because of the size and the numbers. Now, you small Uganda, who will recognize you if you don't have internal innate power? So the question of the African people realizing the need to actually push the continent beyond where it is today. And remembering that it is our responsibility as the African people. And you know, we have the goodwill. We have people who indeed 
would have given anything they have to see Africa better than it is today. But they have been, of course, frustrated. That's what I could add. Mm -hmm. But certainly, internal capacity to deal with threats is very important. Okay. But two, and this is what I, I was saying when we were off air, as an economy, as Africa, what do we have to sell? Because revenue is important. I would like to add that before I forget this, in our own journey to independence, the starting I said was faulty politically, but two, we were fragmented. And unfortunately, no effort was made to try and consolidate what had been fragmented. Mm -hmm. So you have people forcefully brought together, you call them Uganda. But when you meet each individual, she's a Muganda, a Minyankori, an Acholi, an Alur. I think the only president at independence that tried to break these differences is Mwari Munyere. And no wonder, when you meet a Tanzanian, he says, Mimi Mswahili. And uh, Timothy, I want to share with you what annoyed me one day. We have traveled to Da as a committee of parliament, and the member of parliament is asking this Tanzanian, what is your tribe? I put the man behind, I said, you want to get a view? <laughs> <laughs> so we can then evidently say that the divide and rule the divide and conquer uh -huh. application was to the downfall of Africa even to present day. Is that an analogy that uh, Timothy like, would have uh, ex The usual excuses by Africans. <laughs> Always excuse it. In fact, in fact, one day I was talking, I was talking to an Ethiopian uh, citizen in Kampala and talking about all this, you know, all these different tribes and uh, little groups and clans and that being a problem. And he said, actually, it's not such a problem as you imagine. Then he said, look at uh, Somalia. Essentially, one people, one religion, and uh, the only differences in clans. Look at the endless wars. Look at Lesotho. Virtually one people, but the number of military coups they went through. Look at um, Rwanda and Burundi. Essentially, you know, they have a national language, same people essentially, but look at all these genocides and coups and whatnot. Look at Kenya with its Yes, different ethnicities, but look, but it has a national language, Swahili. But look at the tribalism inherent there. So his argument, any anyway, was that then look at countries like Cameroon, stagnant, yes, under Paul Beer with so many tribes and whatnot, but you don't hear military coups in Cameroon. So now, as you're trying to say that this argument of very different tribes brought together artificially and what not necessarily, as I said, Somalia is a very good example of how you can be essentially just one person and are divided along that way. So I would disagree with this idea of we're fragmented. But in general, my view is that what else could it have been if it, it wasn't for it? But they just go back to say about size. Um, India, huge subcontinent, before it was partitioned to Pakistan and Bangladesh, was colonized by small England. So I guess size is not always everything. Uh, it still depends. And I think China at some stage. Well, now what are they? No, no, they're now strong, but, yes. uh, but, the, but the most important point is that there was a point when size did not help them. So it is something different now. You can be strong. You can be Switzerland, tiny Switzerland with a great national strength, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, small countries. You can be big, disorganized, um, you know, Congo. You can be India, Pakistan, that sort of thing. Anyway, my view is just that... Um, these excuses of who were who were colonized, who were manipulated, who were done ABC. Was, well, that still shows your weakness. In the Football World Cup, it is not the job of Germany to help Senegal get to the quarterfinals. It is the job of Germany to make it as difficult as possible for Senegal to score, and it is for Senegal to understand that and try to defend its goal and score if possible. That's the nature of the world. I agree this with moral that. idea of they did this to us, yeah. they colonized us, they manipulate us. Well, that's what it is. Well, it, it, interestingly, the, uh, the reality of the matter is also that <laughs> fact that even if they did these things, uh, divide and conquer, uh, do the borders here and there in one way or another, um, 
so many historians keep allude to the fact that whatever they did in those times was better and they've still continuously applied to present day Africa and the, the African continent could even be further affirmed. What they did was better. You see, again, one of our, um, in my humble view, the challenges the continent faces is the mind, our colonized mind. And if you notice, we always think the others are better than us. Because the African was born in a continent that had food. And so struggle was not part of their the DNA. The, because there is no need to struggle to survive. Now, however, reality has caught, us, caught up with us. If you look at the entire Sahara region, we either have to think or we are going to perish because of the climate. Mm -hmm. Now, we did not want to think, so we followed what we found. All right? Mm -hmm. But in earnest, if you could have a head of state say, we shall not wait for Karamoja to develop, and that's a head of state. In my humble view, that's already the forward to start. Two, how are these uh, independence parties formed? It was either a region or a tribe. Uganda National Congress was started, if I come home, by uh, Musazi, Kunuka, and others, but they happen to be Anglican. And so the Catholics said, wait a minute, what will, who will defend us? So the DP is formed two years later for the Catholics. Now, what if you guys want to exonerate the colonialists? Being Chanuka won elections in 61. But the British could not leave a Catholic in charge. So they take the excuse of Uganda boycotting the elections and organize a fresh election in 62, where now we have the alliance between Kabaka Eka and the UPC, Anglicans coming together. That's a wrong start, and it has built a wrong Uganda mm -hmm. based on those. So for me, I can't exonerate them because they manipulated. Congo, they had it, told the Congo in five months, you are getting independence. Five months. They had ruled them for a century. How could they be prepared for elections? Yes, these people I, you mentioned, Rwanda and Burundi, don't forget that there was a deliberate effort by the colonial master to actually create a difference between the Tusi and the Hutu. Whereas essentially the Tusi or Hutu was dependent on their economic status, he's hyped a particular group to be more intelligent, smarter, and they made them overrule the others. Hence, building hatred that never existed. Mm. So you, you can't exonerate them on this. Uh, and. Uh, if only at independence we tried to correct these errors, probably it would have been different. You are said an Ethiopian. The sad story indeed is Ethiopia, it was not colonized. So uh, my argument <laughs> in Ethiopia does not apply. <laughs> yes, in fact, like I keep telling my Ethiopian friends, I say, in fact, people, if this is, they actually was, if you, any, uh, that's a whole long story, but if you actually deal with typical Ethiopia, I don't want to criticize the country for so many reasons, but you think there's a problem with tribalism in countries like Uganda, you should see if you why do you think there's all this Tigray and Amhara and whatnot, those sorts of wars. So it's colonialism is is partly an excuse, but as I said, um once again it is the job of uh, the coach of Germany to make sure that uh, if you're in the same group as this African team called Angola, whichever disorganize them, score nine goals if possible, hammer them, that's the nature of this and, thing. And, and the coach at the time uh, was meant to be um, the organization of the African unity. unity yes. um, then today is the African Union. Mm. Has that coach done anything in regards to 
and setting the mindset that has I been uh, for the 60 years plus and uh, setting up a new mindset because the question would be what's the one you have alluded to the one that we are supposed to be unsetting but we are unsetting to what then so I, that at least I'm sure I can answer mm -hmm. uh, in 2001 I got the OAU or African Union headquarters and the suburb and ask those people the very same question so I'm in the office of the like the you know information office and whatnot the Nigerian and the old intercom things excuse me have you worked on the trip the ticket for my wife and whatnot yes what flight is it and all this that sort of thing and I, so I asked this man I said is this all you people do here at the OAE headquarters the so-called OAE headquarters you know vouchers processing things booking flights for spouses and children and this man laughs and says I can't understand you disappointed us <laughs> in other words in summary if you got the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, you will be disabused of all this optimism mm -hmm. about Africa for those of you and uh, like my co panelist <laughs> think of Africa. Look at the European Union. First of all, what has the OAU always been or the African Union? Isn't it just summits? It's yeah. always heads of state summits every year, different capital cities and whatnot. Talk, speeches and all this. Look at the European Union by contrast. The European Union is yes has its summits, it has its embassies, offices. Tell me of any city in Africa, you know, where there's like an OAU office or African Union office that does all the routine day-to-day -day paperwork and mm -hmm. what, like the way you say European Union, currency and all these things, trade deals and all the just that whole fishing rights, solving disputes between Ireland and Finland and whatnot. We don't have it. ours is just talk by the heads of state. So Africa has so many fundamental weaknesses, you can't exhaust them in a program like this. And my personal view from experiencing us, from watching us, even on platforms like social media where we're all like in masses, express ourselves freely. The 13 years I've been on social media have just taught me exactly what you said, Gideon uh, Kolejo, it's in our minds. Very complex thing, but it's in our minds, and the colonialism is just an excuse. Mm -hmm. In fact, colonialism might, in my opinion, have been one of the great favors done to us. Just that few, because wh what will they, what will they have been if they didn't come? Mm -hmm. All these Okaganda, uh, Musoga, mm -hmm. and all these kingdoms. What about all these small? Would we have all? And when we went to this world of the, the United Nations General Assembly, was going to be, were we going to have what? 400 African states, each with a flag, national no, currency. Mm -hmm. To the contrary. Mm. To the contrary. You see, nature has its process. How did these other empires grow? The stronger conquered the weaker. Mm -hmm. And they expanded. This was going to happen. You can be sure as the day follows the sunset. A country like Bunyoro would have conquered all these other states. They were going all the way up to Karagwe. Mm. If they were not interrupted, they defeated the Sasamo Rebecca. So, me, I'm confident that the African empires over the time would have grown to become nations. Buganda is a nation by all standards. So, but it was disrupted in its growth, they were competing with Bunyoro, so the stronger would have conquered the weaker. It wouldn't have remained fragmented. Okay. And that's what, what our first argument. Mm. Our growth process was interrupted rudely. Okay. Mm. Um, it all comes down to mindset, the way we are right now, uh, different mindset. Mindset. Of, co of course, <laughs> there's one that has uh, opened up a kind of ones of uh, perhaps colonialism was to the advantage of where we are today and uh, not I, such I, a bad I, idea. I, I As, uh, again, it's a mindset yes. thing that we have to exactly. deal with. So imagine my two panelists are already disagreeing. How do we expect a unity across Africa? Okay. Well, we're going to answer that perhaps when we return after this break watching morning at NTV analyzing the history of African unity of course uh, that African uh, liberation day that is marked and recognized and commemorated on the 25th of May uh, 1963 so the formation of the African uh, organization of the African Union or unity for that unity. matter but the big question still lingers 
where is the unity? We're not seeing the unity. Our forefathers of democracy were actually trying to push forward for the Kwame Nkrumahs of back in the day, uh, what they were fighting for, what they were trying to bring out, the difference, trying to make Africa independent of what had been of the different colonial masters. Today, uh, it's quite different. We seem to be having more dependence on the you know, Western world than it was back in the day. Uh, but of course, something that came out of the conversations earlier on was the fact that uh, as Africa, what do we have? in exchange, uh, what do we have to give? What can we concentrate on and build upon to be able to have our own sovereignty and authority and power and command uh, against the, the other forces that do come into play when it comes to integration and things like that. Let's talk about the African uh, economy, the trade, the industries present and past. And when it comes to the comparisons of regions, the Eastern region, the Western region, the Southern region, what have we seen these different regions do to boost themselves? For example, if we were to look at the southern region, you get to see that combined they do have a GDP gross uh, expectation of 29 trillion US dollars by 2050. And so what is that region doing south of Africa to be able to collectively achieve and later on shape uh, Africa in terms of economies? So let me start with uh, Mr. Kariyajire. Well, um, this, this whole question of regional integration, which President Museveni keeps harping on about, uh, okay, let's just go start with the East African community we're more familiar with and close to home. There's the original three nations East African community, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Now expand it, include Rwanda, Burundi, I think South Sudan, Congo, that sort of thing. But let's just say, okay, now we have this East African community. New people visit, uh, and the viewers visit, you know, various shops and supermarkets in Uganda, where in what product have you ever seen of Burundi on these supermarket shelves in Kampala, Jinja, and Tebe and Barara, Gulu and whatnot? What products of Congo do you see now that the markets have been open? Rwanda. What products do you see? It's always basically. Nakavanga. Yes, <laughs> yeah, Nakavanga, exactly. That one, yes, I noticed. <laughs> and one or two, I think there's some, and they've got very nice tea and whatnot. But the domination of our supermarket shelves is. Kenyan products and Ugandan products of the five countries. So once again, it just shows you that you can't speak things into reality. You can't just declare a common market. You can't just declare it's uh, you know an integrated market. The reality will just show you that it's still. This. But even incidentally, Tanzania also second biggest economy in East Africa after Kenya. But there are not too many Tanzanian products you see, although in a certain sense. It, politically, Tanzania seems to lean more towards Sada, yeah. the central yes. southern Africa, yes. than it does Uganda. So, but still, although it's one of the historic founders of the East African um, community, you don't see many ordinary products. Even in terms of the border movement, you can use the national ID of Uganda and Kenya and so on. Tanzania is still somewhat different. So they've had, they were originally under Nyerere, um, Kenyatta and Obote, an integral part of this East African community. But I think lately they have begun, I think, developing hesitation about Uganda, especially starting from around 2005. And now they lean more toward uh, the southern part of the continent. But then once again, South Africa itself can barely s supply itself electricity. And of course, many of you are familiar with this question of the flight connections. It's cheaper to fly from uh, is it Entebbe to London than I think was it in Nairobi to Entebbe, that sort of thing. The connections alone across Africa, the headache just to get from Uganda to, let's say, Benin, will take you s many more days and many more connections and many more expenses than going from Entebbe to even New York and whatnot. So, in other words, you can't get around these facts. You can't just speak unity, you can't just make declarations of intent. You must be organized, work these things, you must know what you're trading. And the most annoying thing over the last um, tw 22 years, ever since China joined the World Trade Organization, is that, like the way I said earlier, that the English Premier League, as I joked on Twitter two, three months ago, has become the, the one thing that has managed to get Africa's populations united more than the OAU or African Union could do. Now Chinese goods have also become the economic mm -hmm. unity of Africa. So whereas when these borders are open, the common thing across all these, most of these uh, South African countries is cheap mm -hmm. 
um, fairly low quality Chinese goods flooding the market. So the more Africa unites into one market, the more China just floods that same market. So we can't produce much. And then also, we produce much of the same things. So even if you open the border of Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, or Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, South Sudan, what do we produce? It is still the same. Potatoes, maize, and so on. The milk, the eggs. The milk okay. and eggs. All yes. right. So it, it comes down to we have shared uh, things that we ought to be selling one to another. Uh, then the Chinese come in and give you what the very same eggs and milk at, at uh, a lower cost, <laughs> which means that they're still going to infiltrate the markets uh, because of the free trade that exactly. it, it, it presents itself. It helps itself. China more than helps Africa. You see, don't never forget the history. No, but said our the, economies said the bus can start halfway, but yeah. our economies were designed to serve the metropole. Hence the growth of coffee, cotton, tea. Mm -hmm. The things we were not consuming. And then what are you buying? The things from there. And every colonial master made sure the economy faced their capital. In fact, to date, the former colonial, uh, French colonies rather, unless something is from France, they don't use it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that mindset, you can't talk of economic integration and people will listen to you. Two, Integration, in, in, in our view, some of us who believe in it, is about building a market. The bigger, the better for your producers. You see? Yeah, but on the other hand, appetite. the producers have the challenge of there's a producer who's giving you the same thing but at a lower cost, and the producer who's giving you another thing at a you know a higher cost. So the no, we, the we demand have, and supply still comes into play, uh, where advantage. you have to save and make sure that you make a better decision. We have a, the principle of comparative advantage. There are things we produce better and cheaper. So that's where the consolidation should have been. Because I can assure you, in the entire East and Central Africa, we are the best, cheapest food producers. That's where we should have concentrated. And we would and have been do, having more food, but that food will addition. be becoming uh, perishable, yet we can do value addition. Of course, mm -hmm. do value addition. But that, from what I'm saying, in the first instance, can we clear our minds to appreciate that we have we have a responsibility as Africans to change our conditions of living. Because when you interact with many people, the tendency is to think somebody else will solve the problem. It's as if someone else owes us a living. Afande, how do we deal with the value addition given the fact that even the standardization is set by the metropole that you talk about? That's what I'm saying. The, hence the importance of intra-African trade. If they're raising the battle high for you, trade among us yourselves. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned earlier in the program about the starvation in the Sahel region. We have food here which is rotting. 2018 I was in Botswana and I found they had produced only 24% of their maize requirements. That very year, Uganda had a bumper harvest of maize. All right? Mm. Botswana is not very far. And you have people who every morning go to office in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. <laughs> what are they doing there? If they can't get to market for this maize. Mm. Recently, again, because Mr. Makukrach had predicted a food shortage, the president ordered the uniformed personnel to produce maize. Prisons, pr police, police, I don't know whether police has land, the army. We have produced tons and tons of maize. You must deal with the storage so that this maize is not wasted. However, there are people who need this maize. Kenya has again brought the issue of <laughs> aflatoxins to frustrate our maize. Mm -hmm. No problem. They grind our maize 
into maize flour. Ready for consumption. You see, I, 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 it's about thinking. You close my okay. path here, yeah. I open another one. Mm. So the African people must appreciate that the African continent, one, it's uh, the second biggest. Two, it's now the only resourced continent where everybody is rushing. Three, that we have been fragmented too long, uh -huh, too weak for a long time for anybody to come and do whatever they want. Lastly, the challenges of security on the continent will not be resolved by foreigners. And yet we keep giving incentives to foreigners. We keep opening our arms to foreigners to come in and help us support our economics, our social development. You have two options. Either tighten your belt and close off. We, uh, uh, <laughs> Please allow me. Allow me <laughs> no, before, before, before you do so, yes. I believe uh, that uh, Kanyejire here has a okay. different opinion because for him he's independent. For you, you, may, you could be leaning to the protection of government. No. Uh, but on no, this on particular this matter, um, how do we then shape the next 60 years to, the to contrary, become the unity the that I'm we want to here. see of? The views I'm giving here let's, are let's, let's from, from UPDF. UPDF. <laughs> <laughs> Not UPDF, of course, yes. As I said, at the end of the day, you know, there's something Jesus Christ said. Ye shall know them by their fruits. All these things you're saying, we intentions, good ideas, speeches from Mkuruma <laughs> to whoever, to, uh, you know, Nyerere, all that, all that is part of it. And that's what I'm saying. The good tennis player is the one who gets the ball over the net. Right. This argument of I would have been out of one Wembley down of the US Open, but there was a net there. The net is the barrier built into tennis. You don't say I would have scored 40 goals, but the match was only 90, 90 minutes. 90 minutes is a built-in fact of football. It is for the good coach and the good player to be mindful of the 90 minutes and to do everything to penetrate the defense and eventually score a goal. So what we're failing at, it's what I'm listening here is the usual talk. We can, we should, we must, if we could, only we were ears. So why don't we do all these things? And I remember one time I was thinking about this crisis of Africa. You know, there's this argument of pressure, the Don Williams song, Pressure Makes Diamonds, put people under pressure, and uh, then they will, you know, be innovative. Invention is the mother of, uh, no, necessity is the mother this of invention. Necessity is the mother of invention. If you, go, in the 1990s, there came a crisis across Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, which was, I think, the biggest since the trans-Saharan slave trade. And this was the epidemic called AIDS. It was the one cri I guess we can agree with that, the biggest crisis to face the ordinary African across every social True. level. There is no family you can think of in Africa that can say they haven't lost a single relative, cousin, uncle, parent, neighbor, and so on. So in other words, AIDS in the 1990s, late 80s, 1990s, early 2000s, was the one crisis that should have made us do all the things uh, Brigitte Kulaija is saying, think fast, integrate, save resources. But go through Uganda newspapers as an example in the 1990s and see this country, which was one of the epicenters of the AIDS epidemic, and see what are they publishing? AVF 1992, uh, CA elections 1994, uh, constitution, this versus so and so, Wapa Kabul is fighting so and so for Nambali, sit in ABC, 96, the election was Paul Simogere versus Mseveni, IPA, what is it, the Interparty forces ABC, that usual thing. Ordinary events bickering at the constitution levels, so and so is fighting. And yet the media is supposed to be agenda setter. Yes, but even then the media was, to be fair, it was reflecting the times. That's how people want it. So you would think with this crisis that's wiping out families and people by the millions across yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. how come you don't see ma resources being diverted, let's say, as well as from the army, but well, okay, f let me just say it mm -hmm. since here, from the military expenditure to health, to medical research. Instead, once again, what was it? It was the usual people in America, Canada, France, the UK, doing research into AIDS. The people, you know, 400,000 people are the 
AIDS victims in the US, Ethiopia 4 point something million, South Africa 4.7, that sort of thing. So you could see that even with this existential crisis, we still fail to get this sense of commitment, that sense of ad total urgency. And so I ask the question, if the AIDS crisis could not get the African mind to focus and be serious, what will ever make us serious? And the question is no. That's why I said uh, during the, 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 before the show began. But, uh, but as as, as you come in, Afande, um, he has talked about crisis and uh, the kind the, uh, of the, that is that it is either survive or die, and you can't do it, and you still see money coming in from the western. Which relates to the civil wars that we're continuously seeing emerging in different faces and different parts of uh, um, of the continent. The most current is where you see Sudan and the warring sides, and as we speak today, it has become a tribal uh, issue uh, in regards to what's happening there. But these continuous wars, internal and external, are causing a lot of tension, and it begs the question, what's the role of the African Union after all in present Day time to unite Africa. I wanted to inform him that um, for us we established the Joint uh, Research Center That's a number, yes. uh, to do to actually research on HIV, particularly. So we did not, as the army, mm -hmm. much as you want resources diverted from us, <laughs> as the army we took the challenge head on, and I think Dr. Mujeni did a very tremendous job in the. Uh, alleviating even the problem, first in the military and then the rest of the country. But uh, correctly, even when we are faced with a crisis, we still hope, that's what I said earlier, that somebody else will deal with the problem. To your question of civil wars, civil wars are a product of failure of national consciousness. How do you first of that citizens of a country mm -hmm. can decide to bomb it, to bomb their own country, as if they have another one they are going to? I don't first of it. But you see, again, the whole problem is getting uh, a prostitute on the wedding table. The rapid force, as it is called, were able the other day, but hyped by Al Bashir against the people of Darfur. They were used to their desert, to their simple life. You bring them to Khartoum, where there are skyscrapers, where they eat, live. They have no attachment to that, to those things. They are not there. It's back to the question of national integration. But Sudan you're talking about ha has been at war since 1956. They have their independence. Again, you see, your history matters. If you live in an abusive relationship, in an abusive home, where your parents are always at war, Believe you me, 90% chances are that you will abuse either your children or you abuse whoever is weaker than you. The history matters. Now, civil wars on the continent, some are internally caused, others are external. The Sudan conflict you are seeing today is not purely internal. There are external factors involved. And when you're going to deal with this problem, the role of the African Union, therefore. Now, the African Union, he did mention what you found, and he's perfectly correct. People mind about those things. And the um, flights, major allowances. And if you want to prove this point, when we went in 2007, nobody wanted to step there. Until the UN dollar came on the table. Then you had the Nigerians come, you had the Kenyans come. I mean, even if they protest, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. They only came on board when there was a UN dollar. Before the UN dollar came, nobody was interested in Somalia. Okay. And look, 
who disturbed in Nigeria? They came from Somalia, Boko Haram. Probably if they had come out at the time they were asked to do so, we would have stopped these fellows from building capacity. Mm -hmm. So again, do we actually know what we want and we go for it? All right? Mm -hmm. So the role of the African Union, they set up the African Union Security, Peace and Security Committee. It did ask regions to form regional forces, standby brigades. Eastern Africa made one. It's ready for deployment. East African government has tried to deploy in Eastern DRC. You have seen the developments going on. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think as Africans, we must do what the Uganda say. Mm. We must agree. Again, he said those are the speeches. But that there is no other way. It's the speeches that create the action. Uh, so speaking of speeches, there's been this whole speech of patriotism, um, a, a song of motivation, leaders, uh, it's talking about patriotism, love for country, love for country. In the past, perhaps it worked. Uh, today, it seems to have faded away, and yet perhaps it's very important for the new Africa we are trying to rebuild. But like you just said so well a moment ago, we don't know what we want. That for me is the core. So all these things about Africa, you can see in everything we're discussing, the same theme comes up. People who don't know what they're doing, who fight against their own interests, who are clueless. You close, you're part of an East African community, you close the border for three years, you bring in, you know, you, you bomb in the skyscrapers in Khartoum, you don't know, this is your capital city, that character that we have. Like I said, this thing, for some people, some people have even reached the stage of saying, maybe this thing is just biblical. Like, if you check some <laughs> parts of the Bible, there are parts of the Bible which describe Africa, and you say, if you want to see proof of that <laughs> book, must be the word of God. Look for the parts of it that talk about African same character as you see today. Mm -hmm. People who don't want to do it. And then, at the end of the day, I want to go back to this very important point you raised uh, about economic activity. Assuming, let's just say, best case scenario, all our problems, frustration, incompetence is wiped out overnight. By the beginning of June the 1st this <laughs> year, <laughs> all African countries, no shilling stolen, no corruption, parish development mode, every single shilling in every country is preserved. And then every African government sends $10,000 to every home in Africa as money being saved from all this corruption and capital flight in ABC. What would every African family do with that $10,000? As in this is now basically perfection. No more, all misrule ended, resources saved, and the government can do what they do in some of these countries, like in Arab just send $10,000. What would you do with it? They yeah, buy TV, those who have power. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, even if all the weaknesses, misrule, waste of resources, and all is stopped immediately, all this corruption and loss of money, and the government is almost like confused about what to do with the revenue, and says, okay, as a Christmas gift or whatever, let's just give these give people all 10,000, as you just said exactly. Uh, perfumes from wherever. Every home in Africa will get a satellite dish. Yes. No, 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 no prizes for guessing what the dish will be about. English Premier League. Yeah, and then our ladies will all want to go and give birth in, I don't know, London, wherever. So in other words, that even at best, we still will just send out. So that's why you can sometimes see the West is not bothered by governance. They'll pretend, but they know there is war in Africa they still gain. There is peace in Africa, it's they gain. gain. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's a very interesting analogy. But also, I think it's a, it's a difficult time that we're in right now. Uh, COVID-19 brought into the reality of the matter that it's it's now a, a unified globe. So but for you to have down. unified <laughs> Africa, when there's down. unified globe, it's you're trying to be down. independent, <laughs> which <laughs> independence <laughs> we have failed to get. So a further well, point, as we conclude in this conversation, <laughs> yes. how are we going to look forward to this day with the present discussion on table. No, you see, <laughs> uh, why do we celebrate Christmas? We remember the birth of Christ. Easter should remind us our commitment as Christians to refocus on God. Although 
many from church they go to the bar. The African Liberation Day, in my humble view, should refocus us on the need to indeed liberate Africa, truly. The African Liberation will entail, <laughs> one, address the economic realities we are living in. Two, deal with the mindset. Because that's the biggest sickness we have. Mm. <laughs> what I just told you mm. is a typical symptom of a, a mindset that ha lacks direction. Okay. Mm. So we must deal with the mindset. And, but three, whether you like it or not, unity is strength. All right. We need to unite. Well, thank you so much. And the answer to the Olympian who won Uganda, the first gold medal? Jonah Kibua. How about it? Uh, no, no. It was medal, not was gold medal or medal? Gold medal. Gold medal. Okay, I thought you said medal. No. Because I was <laughs> keen. What did she say? <laughs> okay, because you were Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll turn to you to get that answer. But of course, um, that, that but it, was, it wasn't just a gold medal. It was a gold medal uh -huh. with a new Olympic and world record. Okay, mm. more yes. details have been passed yes. uh, from the historian. Well, that brings us to the end of our Kickstarter conversation. And uh, we'll be coming back to look at some of your answers. And of course, later on, we'll be journeying on to Namgongo, where we do have some pilgrims that have come in uh, from different parts of East Africa to actually make so, homage. Uh, <laughs> That's another, another kind of worms. Of, I'm not opening that kind no, of worms. No, Thank I you. Very give you much. Information. <laughs> yes. We have a Ugandan who went barefooted, mm -hmm. borrowed the shoes from a Kenyan, and the one his feet with a world record. A man okay. called um, Achon. Julius mm -hmm. Achon. Yes. He's now in Parliament. Wow. Okay, that's very interesting. We're going to be taking a short breather, but return shortly. Do stay with us.